students. I hope you're all having a great day to date. My name is Torres and I want to take a moment to thank you for joining me for a little Psych 101. In this video, we will continue to learn about biology and behavior. We'll start to look at the nervous system. Specifically, we will discuss neurons. This video has four overarching ideas. The body communicates using two systems, the nervous system, and the endocrine system. Neurons transmit messages from the brain to the body and from the body to the brain. Neurotransmitters must lock into specific receptor sites to work correctly. And finally, many drugs influence a neurotransmitter's ability to function correctly. The topic of this video will focus on the vocabulary on the following two slides. There's a lot. You can find this information in the Google slide presentation and in the Psych 101 key vocab doc. Both of these files are linked in the description box below. When we looked at the role of evolution and genetics in psychology, we already discussed how everything psychological is simultaneously biological. Humans are biological creatures living in social spaces. To understand human psychology, it is important to study how biological, psychological, and social systems interact. The branch of psychology that researches the interactions of biology, behavior, and mental processes is biopsychology. The anatomy and physiology of the nervous system explains the role of nerve impulses in psychology. Internally, your body has two communication systems. One works quickly, your nervous system, and one works slowly, your endocrine system. We will begin our discussion of the nervous system by looking at the individual nerve cell, which is called a neuron. Neurons are cells specialized to receive, process, and transmit information to other cells in the body. There are over 100 billion neurons in the human brain. This is a diagram of a neuron. Neurons have the same features as other cells like a nucleus, cytoplasm, and cell membrane, but they have a unique structure. The unique structures of the neuron allow it to receive and transmit signals to other neurons as well as other cell types. In order to understand exactly how a neuron works, it's important to look at each individual part of the neuron. The dendrites are tree-like extensions at the beginning of a neuron that help increase the surface area of the cell body. The dendrite is the receiver part of the neuron and accepts most of the incoming messages from other neurons and transmit electrical stimulation to the soma. The central part of the neuron is called the soma. The soma, or cell body, contains the cell's nucleus and life support machinery. The function of the soma is to assess all the messages the cell receives and pass on the appropriate information at the appropriate time. Coming from the soma is the axon. The axon is an extension of the neuron through which the neural impulses are sent. It carries the information to the next cell. In some neuron, like those of the brain, the axons are very short. In others, like those in the leg, the axon can reach three feet in length. The myelin sheath protects and insulates the axon and its electrical signal. Think of it as the plastic coating outside of an electrical cord. By insulating the axon, it speeds up the neural impulse. The myelin sheath is created by a special type of cell called a Schwann cell. Every so often, there will be a tiny gap within the myelin sheath. This little gap is called the node of Ranvier. The node of Ranvier also helps insulate the neuron and facilitate rapid conduction of nerve impulses. On the exact opposite side of the neuron from the dendrites, you will find the terminal button. The terminal buttons are located at the end of the neuron and are responsible for sending the signal onto other neurons. 
At the end of the terminal button is a gap known as the synapse. Neurotransmitters are used to carry the signals across the synapse to other neurons. When an electrical charge reaches the terminal buttons, neurotransmitters are then released into the synaptic gap. While neurons can be different shapes and sizes, they all share a similar structure and function in the same way. Neurons are broken into three categories based on their location and function. Sensory neurons, relay neurons, and motor neurons. Sensory neurons communicate all your sensory experiences to the brain, including vision, hearing, taste, touch, smell, pain, and balance. Sensory neurons act like one-way streets that carry traffic from the sense organs to the brain. Relay neurons make up the majority of all our neurons. Relay neurons transmit messages from sensory neurons to either other relay neurons or to motor neurons using a complex pathway. Motor neurons form a one-way route that transport messages away from the brain to the muscles, organs, or glands. An overview of the stimulus response pathway is, for example, you see some water, right? The eye sees the water, and because the eye has to deal with a sense, sight, a sensory neuron starts to send the information immediately to the brain. The relay neuron helps transmit the information. Once the brain analyzes the information, the brain will send a signal through a motor neuron for the person to move their arm and hands, reach out, grasp the glass, and be able to take a drink. So it works very, very quickly, right? You probably don't even realize this is happening. When you see something and you grab for it, it's a series of those three neurons, the sensory neuron seeing it, the relay neuron helping it get to the brain, your brain analyzing it, sending another signal to your arm for you to be able to pick something up or interact with it. What makes this communication system so amazing is that the neurons actually do not touch, they don't connect, and, but they are still able to send information to one another. The gap between the neurons is called the synapse. It can also be referred to as the synaptic space or the synaptic cleft. An electrical charge races through the synapse to send information super, super fast. The synapse is composed of the terminal button of one neuron, the synaptic space, and the dendrites or cell body of the receiving neuron. To pass across the synaptic cleft, an electrical message changes in the terminal buttons. This change is called the synaptic transmission, and the electrical charge is turned into a chemical message that flows quickly and easily across the synaptic space. For the purpose of this class, we're not going to get into the exact chemistry involved in this biological process. It will suffice to say that either a positive or negative charge exists in the neuron at any one point in time. The electrical charge changes depending if the neuron is at rest or if the neuron is in action. If a neuron is at rest, then we refer to the charge within the neuron as a resting potential. The axon gets its energy from charged chemicals called ions. A resting potential is the difference in charge across the membrane when the neuron is not firing. When the neuron is at rest, there is a slight negative charge. Because the charge is so slight, it's very easy to upset the charge balance. The charge of an excited neuron is called an action potential. Action potentials are the rapid changes in charge across a membrane that occur when the neuron is firing. Action potentials occur in three main stages, depolarization, repolarization, and the refractory period. In the depolarization period, positively charged sodium ions flood into the synapse. The electrical charge changes from that slightly negative charge in the resting potential phase to a positive charge. In the repolarization phase, positively charged potassium ions exit the neuron 
back into the synapse. This restores the slight negative charge within the neuron. The refractory period is the recovering time that a neuron needs before it can fire again. It's the time needed for the neuron to return to the resting potential phase again. Let's look at this diagram. You see that this yellow portion here at the bottom is the neuron, and this blue space out here is the synapse. So you can see in resting potential, the neuron has a slight negative charge. You see the little minus signs down here? It's got a slight negative charge. In the synapse, there's a positive charge because we see all these positive ions right here. So you see this is positive, okay? So in the depolarization phase, all those positives flood into the neuron. This changes the charge from negative to positive. Just think of it as like adding and subtracting integers. Here we had a lot of negatives, all negatives. Here we had a lot of positives. Here, all these positives started flooding into the neuron and it neutralized it and then it started to make it more positive because there was so much of it. In the repolarization phase, the cell wants to be at that negative state. So these channels will open up and potassium will be transported back into the synapse. And as the positives leave this neuron, then the neuron charge will become more negative because we're getting rid of the positive, so we're getting more negative. Finally, once it reaches that slight negative charge again, that's when it's going back to the resting potential. The time it takes between repolarization and getting to resting potential is that refractory phase. At the end of the neuron is the terminal button. Within the terminal buttons are small sacs called synaptic vesicles. These vesicles contain neurotransmitters, which are chemicals used in neural communication. When the action potential reaches the vesicle, they are ruptured and the transmitters spill out. Depending on the type of transmitter, if they have the right fit to a receptor, it will cause a response. The transmitters fit into the receptors like a key into the lock. The right neurotransmitter has to fit into the exact receptor in order for that response to occur. The body is very efficient. Once the receptors are full, if there's any leftover neurotransmitter, then it will be taken back up into the terminal for future use. Your nervous system controls each function, such as your heartbeat, blood pressure, breathing, muscle movements, thoughts, memory, learning, feelings, sleep, healing, aging, stress response, hormone regulation, digestion, and all your senses. It's neurotransmitters that communicate this information throughout the body. The most abundant neurotransmitter within the body is acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is released by most neurons in your nervous system that regulate heart rate, blood pressure, and gut motility. Acetylcholine plays a role in muscle contractions, memory, motivation, sexual desire, sleep, and learning. Imbalances in acetylcholine levels are linked with health issues, including Alzheimer's, seizures, and muscle spasms. Dopamine plays a role in your body's reward system, which includes feeling pleasure, achieving heightened arousal, and learning. Dopamine also helps with focus, concentration, memory, sleep, mood, and motivation. Diseases associated with dysfunctions of the dopamine system include Parkinson's disease, schizophrenia, bipolar disease, restless leg syndrome, and attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Many addictive drugs like cocaine, methamphetamines, amphetamines act directly on the dopamine system. Serotonin is an inhibitory neurotransmitter. Serotonin helps regulate moods, sleep patterns, sexuality, anxiety, appetite, and pain. Diseases associated with serotonin imbalance include seasonal affective disorder, anxiety, depression, fibromyalgia, and chronic pain. 
Medications that regulate serotonin and treat these disorders include selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors and serotonin norepinephrine uptake inhibitors. Norepinephrine increases blood pressure and heart rate. It's most likely known for its effects on alertness, arousal, decision-making, attention, and focus. Many medications, stimulants, and depression medications aim to increase norepinephrine levels to help improve focus or concentration to treat ADHD or to modulate norepinephrine to remove depression symptoms. Glutamate is the most common excitatory neurotransmitter of your nervous system. It's the most abundant neurotransmitter in your brain. It plays a key role in cognitive functions like thinking, learning, and memory. Imbalances in glutamate levels are associated with Alzheimer's, dementia, Parkinson's disease, and seizures. Gamma aminobutyric acid, or GABA, is a common inhibitory neurotransmitter of your nervous system, particularly in your brain. It regulates brain activity to prevent problems in the areas of anxiety, irritability, concentration, sleep seizures, and depression. Endorphins are not neurotransmitters. They do modify neurotransmitters, however. The release of endorphins reduces pain as well as causes feel-good feelings. They are released during exercise, but also some of the most addictive drugs deal with endorphins. Drugs, whether medication, controlled substances, or illegal narcotics, interfere with neural communication. There are three categories that a drug can fit into. Agonists make neurons fire. Antagonists stop neurons from firing, and reuptake inhibitors block the uptake of surplus neurotransmitters. These are some common psychoactive drugs. First, botulism. Botulism blocks the release of acetylcholine at the neuromuscular junction and causes paralysis. Botox is botulism toxin that people use in order to prevent facial muscles from making wrinkles or to reduce the sudden movements from diseases like Parkinson's. Antipsychotic medications block dopamine receptors. They can be used to reduce schizophrenic hallucinations. Caffeine blocks the neurotransmitter adenosine, which controls excitement. By blocking that neurotransmitter, the excitement is less able to be controlled, so it actually increases the release of excitatory neurotransmitters. Cocaine blocks the reabsorption of dopamine. By blocking that reabsorption of dopamine, it leads to a heightened arousal of the entire nervous system because the dopamine cannot be taken back up by the body. The brain can be changed both structurally and chemically. Studies show that an enriched environment leads to larger neurons with more connections. It's still unclear whether the brain is able to replenish new connections or new neurons after neurons are damaged. Some research shows that this is possible, while there is some contradictory research that shows the opposite. Today we learned that the body communicates using two systems, the nervous system and the endocrine system. Neurons transmit messages from the brain to the body and from the body to the brain. Neurotransmitters must lock into specific receptor sites to work correctly. Many drugs influence a neurotransmitter's ability to function correctly. For reflection, please take a few moments to consider the following open-ended question. Do you believe that the mind cannot be separated from the body? I'd love to get your thoughts in the comments below. But that's it for this lecture. In the next lecture, we will continue to discuss the role of the nervous system in psychology. Before you go, don't forget to like this video and subscribe to Stats with Taurus for more Psych 101. Looking forward to it. Ciao!